Good evening, members, and welcome to our uh, webinar. Uh, today we are going to be doing treatment planning case. Uh, so we're going to discuss a case, or Dr. Sheldon will be going over a case, and then I will be going over uh, presenting the case. Uh, the next lecture that we're going to have is actually going to be on the 31st of this month instead of having two in September. We have one on the 31st and then we have one in September and that's because of the AAP meeting um, that's happening in September. Uh, there's going to be a large portion of that time that we're going to be gone. We are going to be at the AAP meeting. We hope that we see uh, you guys there. Uh, Dr. Sheldon will be speaking um, in, at, the, at the meeting. Um, it's going to be at the San Diego Marriott and we will be speaking in the Miramar room, um, and that's on the 12th at 6.30. So please um, uh, arrange to come see us. Come here, Dr. Sheldon and I speak, um, and of course, invite some other um, friends if you have them. Um, so we, uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody then. The title of that is going to be Preparing uh, Your uh, Periodontal Practice for 2020. Uh, so we hope that you are there to hear that. Uh, like I said, uh, last week we did our um, webinar on the videos. We started with the new patient phone calls. The next one we're going to do will be the doctor call. Um, we are doing this in order of the new patient um, calling the schedule and eventually accepting. So today we're going to be going over a treatment planning session. Um, and this is going to be on a full arch case. And actually this is one that we just planned not too long ago. It's a, it's a recent one that you and I did together. And we've actually gotten started with it. So um, let's go over it and let me make this look official for a second. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> so anyway, let's, um, let's go over this because it's a case that essentially ties in perio with dental implant therapy. It ties in perhaps mistakes or errors in diagnosis with how you recover from that. Um, I don't want to say it's an error in diagnosis. I wouldn't say it either. No, 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 that was wrong, but I'm just self, just a self-deprecating individual, as you know. So let's talk about Amy. Amy's 65 years old, and she comes in, I want my smile back. Okay, you can see what she's doing. And by the way, she just recently got a divorce. So that is what she presents with. Let's go to some x-rays and see what she presented with there. And if you take a look, by the way, she had, uh, has had periodontal care um, for at least some of her life. Uh, she had been to a periodontist, periodontist that I know, um, in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I didn't have any communication with him because it had been quite some time since she had seen him, and she'd really been out of the dental arena for yes. a while. You can see she spent money on, on, on her teeth, and you can also see the periodontal condition that she presents with. So let's go through that. And certainly this is going to be of some concern, correct? By the way, this could be of concern as well as you take a look at the endo. And we can take a look at the bone loss that is present here throughout. And we can look at it two ways. And of course, we're talking about treatment planning. We're talking about treatment planning and treatment planning presentation. But, but certainly we can look at treatment planning and we can question whether these teeth have good longevity at the age of 65 or not. We look tooth number seven, tooth number seven barely has anything showing, uh, uh, has any support. But take a look at number eight, does. Number nine has less. But she's 65 years old, certainly we can see the angular defect that's present here. And by the way, she's a class two case. Very deep overbite. So that's what you're seeing, and all of you can see these defects as well as I can. Super up to tooth number 18, and then there's tooth number 19 back into the occlusal plane, as you would expect, with circumferential bone loss in tooth number 20. 21 is okay. See what's going on in the anterior, particularly with tooth number 25. And go across and take a look at the bone support. And certainly in the lower, we can say there's reasonable bone support. We can help this case. And in the upper, maybe yes, maybe no. But remember, she wants her smile back. So let's take a look at the root spacing that's right here. And let's take a look at the overcontoured crowns that were placed at one time in order to be able to close the diastema. And look at the diastema is open here. 
So she certainly has gone through some work in order to be able to get her smile back. And some of this bridge work is what, tens of years, tens, oh, some are 40 she, years 40 old. 40 years old, yeah. yes. So um, there's nothing recent had been done. Let's take a look at her photographs. And now you can see the depth of her overbite. You can see the overcontoured crowns, these uh, what appear to be acrylic veneers or acrylic crowns um, that have been placed. Is that disclosing solution? I'm not sure what that is. Lipstick. <laughs> it's lipstick. <Okay. laughs> um, certainly we've got a dual bite here. You can see how the anterior teeth, the lower anterior teeth are at one level, the lower posterior teeth are at another level. And there's good old tooth number 18 that oh, we yeah. saw, which by the way, you'll see why I wanted to save 18 um, in a moment. Um, I didn't want to save 18 for assorted purposes but I did want to save it for orthodontic anchorage. And there's a smile. And Amy says, I want to get my smile back. Let's take a look at some other things. So there's a periodontal probing on March 14th. You see a class two mobility on tooth number seven. Sorry, class two mobility on tooth number seven, and we can see the depth of pockets. And Amy was a smoker. She yes. had finally stopped smoking. She correct? said she had cut down significantly. She um, has not had any alcohol for five years, and she said um, this year she was down to one cigarette a day. Good. So there she is, and we recommended at that time EAPT, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so that's four hours, uh, endoscopically assisted periodontal therapy, better known as perioscopy. Uh, we call it EAPT. We've called it EAPT, and some of you have seen our videos on why we call it. It's a trademark, not trademark, but it's a, it's a, it's a named procedure that we use, uh, endoscopically assisted periodontal therapy. And so I tell Danielle, listen, Here's what I think we ought to do. I, I think we can at least look in the arena of saving most of the teeth. Let's see what we can do to save most of the teeth, and let's get an orthodontic consult. Right. And that's the direction we went in, and so we made an appointment with the orthodontist, and in the meantime, we completed non-surgical periodontal therapy with this result. Not perfect, perhaps better, and certainly better on the lower. So this is what we saw, and this is how uh, how she ended up during uh, during therapy. And by the way, I do not think that I just showed the right ones. We had better results on this. I believe I, dupl I misduplicated this because I know we did better than that. Anyway, we did better on the maxillary arch than what you're showing. Shame on me. Okay. So that's where we are, and we go to the orthodontist, and the orthodontist, starts looking at the dual bite and, and, and says, you know, I can do something with this, this type of a case. Let's take a look at the panoramic. And here's the panoramic radiograph, and you can see um, that, in fact, this tooth is super erupted, as, as we saw previously. Um, and we can take a look at the bone support and go all the way across. You can see the large excess doses on the lingual here. But there's substantial bone to work with. Let's look at the maxillary arch. Let me move this. I now have learned how to do since the last treatment planning session. And we're looking at our bone support all the way across here, and you can see where it's going. Let me, let me just uh, magnify this a little bit. Now take a look at this, and you can question my judgment here, because you can see there's a class 3 frication between what uh, is the mesobuccal root here and the palatal root. And so we can question the longevity of this particular tooth. I question it. Tooth number two is a little bit better. But something happened interestingly in the meantime, and that is that she fractured tooth number four. And the bridge came off of tooth number six. And so while we went to the orthodontist and we worked up a treatment plan to retract the lower anterior teeth, okay. to change the um, um, the curve of speed and to raise up raise up these posterior teeth, depress the lower anterior teeth in order to accomplish orthodontic retraction so that we can get teeth on the upper that aren't quite so prominent. 
Amy went away. She went away to Connecticut for a little while. And when she came back, her plant control was horrible, and she had broken off this fixed bridge. So they start to think. They say, all right, did I make the right decision for this particular patient? Now listen, bad plaque control is bad no matter how you look at it. If you're saving teeth or if you're putting implants in, bad plaque control is bad, bad plaque control. But in a case like this, you have to ask the question. The patient wants her smile back, and she's not taking care of her teeth very well, and she had a periodontal relapse because when I went back to probe, there was not a 7 millimeter pocket in this area, now there was a 10 millimeter pocket. So essentially I'm looking at it and I'm scratching my head and I'm saying, no, no, this is the wrong decision. Now there's another part of this equation because we had discussed implants when Amy first came in. And Amy said, I can't confront this. I can't confront extracting my teeth. I want you to save them. Do what you can to save the teeth. And that's right. why we entered into EAPT or advanced root planning therapy in order to be able to help this patient. But now we've got something new to deal with. Fixed bridge that's fractured, tooth number three that's not very good. Not sure the tooth number four is going to be that good. And so we've got a right hand right right hand segment that's not going to work very well. Bad plaque control. Tooth number seven is going to be lost because it didn't have a lot of bone support anyway. We knew that going in. Um, but now, is she an orthodontic candidate even though she wants to save her teeth? And the answer to me, and I think to all of you, is a clear no. And so then we have to confront that. We have to confront that ourselves. And then we have to confront that with a patient who came to us with the idea of saving her teeth. And so I talked with Danielle, and I said, we can't save this. And I go back to Amy. And I say to Amy, Amy, you know, we've tried what we could. And this is not a blame game that you have bad plaque control. I, I try not to do that. You know, once in a while I'll succeed. Most of the time I succeed. But the fact is, the factors that aren't lining up. And I'm afraid that if we were to restore your mouth in this condition, then in fact, you'd just be seeing me again with a failure, not too far down the line, having gone through orthodontic therapy and having gone through periodontal therapy and chrono bridge. And even if we put a couple of implants in, I just don't think it's going to solve the problem. So I present that, and I'm going to present, I'm going to show you a couple of things here. Because there are some key elements in this presentation, and given the fact that Danielle handled more than half of this presentation, her comments may be more important than mine. But Amy had seen this picture in our office, or a picture like this. And i got to tell you, if you don't have a picture like this, find one. We got this one off the BioHorizons website. We work with BioHorizons. BioHorizons has some great posters, by the way. Um, but there is a picture that's even more graphic than this, where patients look at that. Particularly female patients, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to look like that. I never want to look like that. We start to use some tools to show Amy, in fact, what can be done. I had this. This is an all ceramic um, prosthesis. It's a cornea prosthesis. And I had this made. I went to the laboratory and I said, make me one. This isn't one where you go to the model company and you say, give me one and I'll pay you $300 for it, uh, you know, off the shelf, like you'll see in San Diego next month. I said, make me one. How much will it cost? And it cost a few thousand dollars for me to have it made. I use this for every full arch presentation that I do. Because you can see, here's the zirconia prosthesis. You can see the gingival tissue. You can see the line here, so people can see what the line will look like. This was made on a on a beautiful um, um, acrylic model. And so they can see the natural gingival tissue against the border here. And um, I couldn't work without something like this. If we're going to sell something like this, we want to have something like this. So person can see it, feel it, touch it, 
And I suppose photographs w will work, but I found the model to be well worth the investment. But don't forget, Amy wanted her smile back. And you and I have talked about we've talked about the, the smile and the Snap software, right. and how within a very short period of time we can take a photograph on the left, and we can substitute uh, array an array a whole library of different teeth, and pick out the set of teeth that would best match the face, and that's something that we can we can achieve. And we, we make it a point not to make any promises. People don't come up to us and say it doesn't look exactly like this. We, you know, we say this is what it could look like. And then Daniel takes off. Right. Are there any things I missed? Let me just make sure there isn't anything I missed here. Nope, that was it. That was the last one. So um, that's where we are. And I, just so that you can see, before I let Daniel carry the ball, I keep on saying she's going to, but so far I'm not letting her. <laughs> we made sure that, in fact, we showed the patient, because you've all seen now the anatomy software, we made sure we showed the patient exactly what could be done here so they see that implants can be placed, how implants can be placed, how implants will fit within the bone, how some alveolectomy may need to be it may be necessary in order to be able to create the result that she wants. But frankly, at that point, it was more confronting the surgery and extracting your teeth than any particular mechanics that we were going to do. Now. Right. Good. So when Amy had come in, just as we have spoken about many of times in our lectures, it's very important for your staff member to form a relationship with the patient and find out what is the patient's ruin. So with Amy, um, and it's very easy for me to do this with patients because I really enjoy doing this, and most of you girls probably will, will as well, is finding out what the story is. So it's obvious, she said, I used to see a periodontist, I used to have periodontal treatment, I've had periodontal surgery in the past, I've taken so long to get my butt in here because I'm just scared to get started. I'm a bit of a chicken in a chair. So we're making her feel comfortable. And then asking her, so why now? Why not before? What is that you really want? That's where I get the story of she just recently got divorced and she was married for a very long time and it was a very long and painful uh, marriage. She wasn't, um, she didn't want to get the divorce. She was very saddened by the divorce. Um, but her, she had some issues with her self-esteem. She wanted to get back out there, smile, laugh, be happy, and eventually find love again. With the smile that she had, she knew that she just wouldn't be able to feel that way out there. She wanted to feel better. Also, with this patient, as we had said multiple times before, don't ever assume the reason why a patient won't go forward is because of the money. It wasn't the money with Amy. Now, Amy is, doesn't have a whole lot of money, but Amy is willing to invest in any amount of money that's going to result in a good smile. However, her fear factor was losing her teeth. So if I were not to um, make her feel more comfortable about that, I could have done this whole thing for a dollar and she wouldn't have accept it, accepted it because she did not want to lose a single tooth. So when Amy first came in, it was, I, want, I don't want any teeth extracted. I want to save all my teeth. I have a huge fear of losing my teeth. I just don't want to lose them. Now, obviously, she doesn't. She hasn't been educated on implants. She doesn't know what implants can do. She doesn't understand what we're getting rid of and what we're trying to replace it with. So, without sitting down and giving her an hour lecture, we are, you know, we have to warm her up to that. We have to show her the value of what we are presenting. So, the first thing we do is we we um, honor what she wants. We try to save the teeth. We tell her we're going to do the best that we can. We're not sure how far we can get with this, but by all means, we saw a window that we could do it. We'll go on ahead and take it. Um, when she came in, and Dr. Sheldon had told her, "Listen, I don't think if, I don't think I can save these teeth. You're kind of sliding backwards. There's a lot of plaque going on in here. This bridge is breaking off in pieces. I know that she wanted to get a bridge. She wanted to, to bridge all these teeth." 
He, and, and he said, I understand that you want to invest all this money, and it wasn't cheap. Upper and lower, it was like $54,000. Um, he said, but I don't feel comfortable with this because I don't think it's a wise investment. So his education with her was, you're going to spend all this money bridging these teeth and doing ortho treatment with these teeth, and I don't know how long these teeth are going to last because of, of course, all the clinical evidence he had in front. And she was getting that, um, but she still wanted to go forward. She still wanted to do the bridge. So when Dr. Sheldon leaves the room, I talk to her female to female, and I say, listen, if it was my mouth, I would be going with the implants. I would go with taking out the teeth, putting in the implants, and I showed her the model and doing this fixed in prosthetic. Um, I told her that she would be getting a beautiful result. I told her she would be getting a faster result. I told her, uh, because we do the immediate temp, um, I told her that she would be getting rid of bad teeth and getting in you know, the good prosthetic. So I was, I was showing her all of the points, as I always do, and she was shaking her head saying, okay, all right, all right, I get it, I see. And I was also selling that it was a, it was a, better, it was a better way to spend her money still wasn't cheap because we're charging $26,000 for it. Um, and she left and she was ready to go. And as she was leaving, she, she was already planning who was going to drive her to the appointment. She was talking herself into it and she was warming up to the idea. We had arranged for her to come back because uh, she had to, um, she had to, she wanted to bring her friend in with her to do the pre and post ops because so her, her friend was going to help take care of her. So she wanted that and she also had to go to the bank to get the money. So he pointed her to come back in a week. Within three days, Amy calls and she talks to the receptionist and she wants to cancel this appointment. So again, as we always say with our lectures, don't allow the front desk to cancel these appointments. What they do is find out what financial um, assistant was taking care of the patient and you say to the patient, I see Danielle is working with you. I'm going to have her give you a call right back to the patient and she will assist you and making these arrangements. So she's not saying she's not going to cancel it, she's just going to say Danielle was taking care of you and I'm going to have her give you a call. We never have a problem with that, so she was fine with that. I give her a call back and she just expresses that she is um, very concerned with um, having the teeth come out. She doesn't think that she can do it. She said she's panicking, she's having, she just can't take it. So I just said, listen, come back in and let's talk with Dr. Sheldon. Because, you know, let's, let's find a plan that you're going to be comfortable with. Let's find something that you're comfortable with, and we don't have to go forward with this, so just calm down. Don't worry about it. Just come in, and let's just get all this arranged. So she, she did agree to come in, but she was adamant, saying she's not going to do this. So when she comes in, I do this, as you see on the screen, I did this um, snap smile. I didn't do it in the first place because we were saving the teeth, and I, it wasn't the first thing that I did. So I did this while she was waiting for Dr. Sheldon. I again got the model, and when I walked into the room, that poster that he showed you was hanging on the wall. And she said to me, I, I didn't show her this, this picture yet. She said to me, I do not want to look like that. I do not want to get my teeth taken out because I do not want to look like that. Um, she said, when, my, when I was married, my husband always told me, just take out your teeth and get dentures, and let's stop messing around with this. It's cost too much money. So she said all she can think about is her husband getting his way and her ending up with dentures and looking like this. So she was, she was in tears and she was just panicking and she said, I, I'm not doing it. I'm not extracting my teeth. So then it was a re-education. I said, listen, you are not going like, to look like this. If you get dentures, you will look like this. But the prosthetic that we are going to give you, the implants we're going to give you is going to make a, a healthier field for you, your body, your smile, everything. I said, we're going to take out all these bad teeth. We are going to put in six healthy implants, and we're going to put in this beautiful prosthetic. And I showed her the poster, which, again, we got from BioHorizons, that shows that the implants are like prosthetic roots, and it gives the body reason to not get rid of all that bone. So it's going to prevent her from all that atrophy. It's going to, she's, she you know, will lose some bone, but she's not going to lose all that bone to end up looking like that poster. And she didn't get that before. It was a miscommunication. It was something that we didn't make clear. And so I was telling her that she's going to maintain her facial bone. 
Um, once I said that, it was a whole new light went off. And I told her, new roots, healthier field in there. Get rid of the periodontal disease, all these teeth that are ca causing all these problems that are breaking down and, and decaying, and let's get this beautiful prosthetic in there. Then I showed her the snap picture, and she just said, oh my gosh, how, how am I going to say no now? She said, this, there, this is what I want. I, I just sign me up, get me started. I want to be able to smile like this. I want to be able to um, have this confidence. This is what I need to go on. And um, she said, um, she thanked me for my time. She said, you just made it all clear. She, we did her pre and post op. We did the paperwork. She gave me a check that day. She said, here I called to cancel and I'm writing you a check for the full amount. Uh, we did everything that day um, and we spent some time talking until she was completely comfortable. I checked back with her the next day. I gave her a call um, just to see how she was doing. We joked about, you know, my fear of her canceling. She said, well, are you afraid I want to cancel again? Um, so, you know, we just kind of kept that relationship and I did keep tabs on her just to make sure she was feeling okay. So the biggest selling point here was one, indeed it was tools. It was that snap. It was the prosthesis. <laughs> it was the, um, the panoramic CAT scan picture that showed her bone levels and what we're trying to preserve. Uh, it, and it was definitely finding out what her ruin was because like I said before, if I would have focused on the amount and tried to discount the amount to get her to, to, to keep her appointment, she would never have accepted because it wasn't the money. She had the money. It was the fear of losing her teeth, losing her bone, having that sunken face look, um, her husband, her ex-husband getting his way. Um, and that's what she, that was what the problem was coming. So it does, sometimes these cases, especially she was a magazine patient. She came from the magazine. Yeah. So she had seen a dentist three, three doors down. Is he For a while. Yes. Yeah. And she... I think he's moved away now. Yes. Then he moved to another office. Is yeah. he a periodontist or is he a... No, he's a general dentist. dentist. Yeah. But he does this work as well. He does this. And she had got her magazine at Publix. And uh, she was looking at her magazine and that's what she wanted. So she was an unreferred patient sent here. So as we said before, she's not a prepped, referred patient. We have to spend that time to prep her. But it pays off. It pays off because... Um, she just didn't understand what all we could offer her. She was looking to save these teeth to get the result that you see on this picture. Don't forget, we're looking at emotional triggers here. Every bit of what Danielle was talking about was not physical, how are we can take this tooth out. It was, you're going to be able to preserve your bone and not look like that emotional trigger. You're not going to have to listen to what your husband told you to do all the time. Emotional trigger. You're gonna have a pretty smile, emotional trigger. You can get back into 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 living again and and be happy with your smile and perhaps find a new love, emotional trigger. So often we as um, as dentists and as periodontists get so involved with with technicalities and types of bacteria and that's not that's not important. It is. But the fact is that people are making these major decisions based on an emotional trigger only. Take a look at the advertising that goes on by that um, company that um, that does um, full arch cases and is advertising all over the country. It's an emotional trigger. So part of this is to form a relationship. Part of this is develop trust. Part of this actually is to go back and admit that perhaps you made the wrong decision, and that I have to take some responsibility for that decision. Now you might ask: the patient went through full mouth root cleaning. What did we do about that since just a couple months later we're saying that failed? What do we do about it? If, if, it, if it were to fail? Yeah, if, if the root planing failed and it just yes. did, or at least it did on the, on, the, on the lower arch, we're doing yes. okay, and the upper arch, it wasn't doing well. You know, we gave her credit for that. Correct. We credited that towards her implant case. Right. I'd rather not, <laughs> but, you know, I also do, don't want a patient to feel as if he or she has wasted his or her money. Um, you know, people are paying. This is not fee for service, and I've written about this before. This is fee for result, and that's what we're doing. Is frankly, that's coming down the pike anyway. Particularly if the government gets involved and insurance companies get involved, and of course we're trying to avoid that. Um, 
hopefully forever, but at least for as long as possible. It is fee for result. Frankly, I take that very seriously. If a patient is going to invest money with us and it fails, then, um, you know, I'm taking some of that burden because I'm the diagnostician. I should have known that in advance. And while we can't know it 100% of the time, we can know it 98% of the time. So if we flub up, it's a little flub up, and it's a little bit more of an incentive for the patient. Listen, I'll credit all of the money that you spent on the replaying on the upper arch. Let's, uh, in this case, we credit all the money on the replaying uh, yes. in order to be able to go to the next, next result. We want to take barriers away from acceptance, uh, barriers from uh, away from from accepting treatment. That's barriers. We take barriers away to en enter our office. Seventy nine dollars cat scan. Barriers away to accepting treatment. If there was a barrier, the patient said, "I wasted my money." Fine, let's do something about that, and get to the point where the patient has treatment done. You know what? The bottom line is just fine. You can do just fine doing this. Um, so that's that part of it. Anything else that you wanted to add to that, Daniel? No, that was really it. I mean, as far like I said, it, as long as you find out what the real ruin is, you don't have to worry about how to sell the treatment plan. I, and there's an office that we're working with now, and it's the hardest thing that I'm dealing with right now with his financial girls is trying to get them to understand that the barrier is not always money. The first thing that they do every time a patient calls to cancel or postpone or schedule out is they offer a discount. They say, let me find out if I can get you a discounted fee. Let me see if I can if I can um, lower the price of this without even finding out what the barrier is. And, and it sounds so tacky. It and, it, and also, if it's not the reason why they're calling to cancel or reschedule, it really confuses them and they get a bad taste in their mouth. Sure, why didn't you give me the discount before? Exactly. Why didn't you give me the lowest price? Exactly. And, and so it's not always the money. And it really, it rarely ever is the money. It's finding out in the beginning, on the phone, the doctor call, when they come in, why now? Why are you deciding to come in now? Because that's the ruin. That's right. So if you have any questions, just uh, ask questions. I don't see any right now. I'll give it about five or ten seconds. Either raise your hand or use the chat line or chat box. And if there's questions about um, things that have happened, uh, then, uh, then let us know. Um, Okay, well that's good. So I hope that this treatment. And by the way, send us an email if, if you have, have have questions. I'll be happy. I'll be happy to answer my part of it. And frankly, Daniel's uh, part of this is more important than mine is. And so is your staff member. Your staff member needs to be educated with regard to what can happen, and needs to know the importance of dental implants in terms of preserving bone, uh, and needs to know what the final result is going to be. And every one of these tools whether it's the model or whether it's the SNAP software or whether it's the anatomized software, all of these things combine very well in order to be able to produce a professional look and gives Daniel every opportunity to be able to, uh, to uh, be able to close the case. So that's it for this edition of the AIP Treatment Planning Session. We'll be back with you on August 31st. That time we'll talk about the, uh, the doctor phone call. And the doctor phone call has changed since we first did the doctor phone call. So we are changing the way yep. we're using that. It's a tremendous screening tool, yes. and it's a tremendous way of being able to prepare our patients for um, for treatment, and also prepare ourselves for uh, for for the patient who may not be uh, really the, the patient for our office. It's also a great way to reduce chair time, so you can fit in more new patients that you see per day. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll see you. Um, and um, mm -hmm. thanks for thanks for your membership. And any questions, give us a call. Night.